This Week in Startups is brought to you by Zapier, the easiest way to automate your work. It connects all your business software and handles the work for you so you can focus on what matters most. Right now through February, try Zapier free for 14 days by going to zapier.com slash twist. Masterworks.io, the first company allowing investors exposure into the blue chip artwork asset class. Skip the 5,000 plus person wait list by going to i.masterworks.io slash twist. And Health IQ. Take as little as 20 minutes to save up to 41% on life insurance premiums compared to other providers at healthiq.com slash twist. This format that we've started is uh, called Open Office Hours. The concept is very simple. Bring us your most pressing issue, the thing that's the hardest for you. And let's just brainstorm, workshop, possible solutions to whatever the problem is. It's very easy to get busy as a founder and do the easy stuff. Uh, and then avoid the difficult stuff. What I'd like everybody to do during this session is to just be really candid about what's not working. What are you scared about? What keeps you up at night? Because we have a culture of everybody wants to be crushing it and everything's up and to the right. Having invested in over 200 companies now, I can tell you that is almost never the case. Like, and by the way, in life, it's almost never the case. When I see people sell their companies and a week later, they call me on the phone crying and say, why did I do that? And I'm like, because you wanted to be rich. <laughs> and so it was an incredible outcome for you. And I'm like, oh, I shouldn't have sold it. I'm like, just enjoy your plane and <laughs> keep, keep moving. <laughs> Take your plane somewhere. Uh, so the existential crisis, the search for meaning, uh, finding purpose, all that stuff is great. Not my expertise. Uh, my expertise is in growing businesses. So, and how investors think, because I've been on both sides of the table. Our first guest today is Trevor. Oh, have a seat, Trevor. Uh, and Trevor <coughs> has a company called Movin. Movin. M O O V I N. With an apostrophe. Uh, no apostrophe. No apostrophe. Just moving. Okay. Which is on-demand software to rent professional furniture collections. And I'm thinking about that one line, which was written by us, not you. Hmm. Uh, sounds pretty simple. Uh, my first question to you is, who is renting professional furniture collections? Is this for staging homes? Is uh, this for people who are have a home and are scared of buying furniture? Who's this for? Yeah, so it's actually for uh, a couple different types of customers, but first and foremost, it's for somebody who is moving around more often in their life and they want to change things up more often and they don't want to go through the hassle factor of having to figure this out themselves. And on top of that, they don't want to have to figure out how do I get really great design. So the one thing that's, I would say missing from that description is that all of our designs really, we, we try to aim to be magazine worthy. So think like Architectural Digest, something that looks really great like that. and that's just not generally something that a consumer can achieve on their own. That's where we come in. So we do not only the rental part, but also the, the design part too. So your interior decorators yep. who, instead of just telling you, um, here's what you should buy and go buy it, or some interior decorators actually go buy it for you and then put a little markup on it. You're saying, and we have it in inventory and we own it and you can rent it from us for a number of years. Correct. <laughs> or, or, or a number of months. Or a number of months. Mm -hmm. Now, the thing that's confusing to me, isn't a large part of the cost of furnishing a house moving all that stuff in? That's 20% of the cost? Yep. Um, 15 in our in our experience, 15%. Okay. But um, essentially, we're combining that, that service, the movement of it, along with the actual rental of the asset itself. Hmm. So essentially, the value to you as the consumer, uh, and it could be a homeowner, it could be somebody that's renting an apartment, it could be a, a couple uh, different types of use cases. But essentially, the value to you is you press a few buttons and it's just done. You don't have to figure out and become the project manager and sort of suss out each step of the process yourself. Got it. And... What are the unit economics on this business? If you had a living room and that furniture, this is designer furniture, so I'll say it's a big living room and a couple of sofas and it costs, I don't know, ten or twenty thousand dollars to furnish if it's high end stuff? Or um, five or ten? Yeah, more like about five. Even less than five in cat. Okay. Cases. So that wouldn't be high end. That would yep. be medium. Yep. But we make that medium end look really great. So it's got it. Okay. So yep. now I've got it much more. You achieving high end results with an affordable price. Correct. So it's $5,000, or let's say $4,000 in furniture to do that room. Mm -hmm. What do you charge them per year? 
Four uh, months. So our break even tends to be about twelve months. So what? Yeah. So my original question was not break even. It was sure. what is the what is it? What do you charge them? I'm trying to get what do they pay? Sure. So on that example, they're probably around probably somewhere around three hundred bucks a month. Got um, it. So after um, some number of months, they would have owned this uh, themselves. Uh, true, except that we're buying from, in many cases, places that they otherwise couldn't buy. Got it. Wholesale. So there's some arbitrage going on there. Correct. So they might have to pay eight or mm-hmm. six. Yep. So, okay. And who is your ideal customer? Uh, so we actually started with one type of customer. And Which we, was? Um, that was home staging. Got and it. And okay. we got the sort of entree to that, mostly because we figured out that the unit economics were 4x better than our original idea, which was for the consumer market. Mm-hmm. So, you know, again, cash is king at time zero. And you're like, okay, I would rather have, you know, four times the money than, you know, one X, right? Yeah. So um, essentially, that's a great business to start with. If you want to use like an Uber example, it's Uber Black. Yeah. But we decided that the same model could be applied to the consumer market, which is much larger. And that's kind of where we're trying to go next. Great. What's your biggest challenge? Uh, fundraising. And so essentially- the- I'm shocked. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> no no one else here has that problem. Um, it, it really is the problem of like, and I'm sure it's it's pretty familiar to you know any of your other companies and stuff like that, but how do you kind of get uh, people's interest that you don't know, you're trying to get introductions to, you're trying to kind of cross the chasm and, and get on the radar, get them excited about what you're doing, but so is everybody else. Yeah. So there's a couple of hacks for this. Um, the number one way to get their attention is with a chart that goes up and to the right mm-hmm. and an amazing business. Do you have that? Yes. Great. Did you set, how many investors did you send an email with your chart to? Um, probably about in the 70 ish range. Perfect. Of those 70, did you have a tracking pixel on it? And do you know how many of them yes. opened it? Mm-hmm. How mm-hmm. many of the 70 opened it? Uh, probably about half. So 35. Yeah, actually, actually a little more than that. I mean, okay. yeah. So let's pick 40 mm-hmm. as a number. 70 you were e- you emailed, 40 opened it. Good. Mm-hmm. Yep. Of those 40, how many replied? Uh, about half. Yeah, 20 replies. Yep. Of those 20 replies, how many were not interested? How many wanted to take a, a meeting? Uh, actually, I'm, my numbers are a little buff on them. So we've had um, a total of uh, maybe about 30, uh, no, that's not true, about 20 meetings. Great. But um, a lot of them just, you know, write out of an email, like, hey, you know, this isn't for me, that sort of thing. Got so, it. Yep. So, uh, to give you an idea of what it's like to be an investor in 2019, mm-hmm. going into 2020, it is impossible to sort through the number of companies now, not only for an individual investor, a partner at a firm or an angel or a seed fund, it's impossible for a fund, even a medium or a large fund, to sort through all the deal flow today. Mm-hmm. There are too many companies. So then we're in a situation where you have to play the numbers game on one side, and the long game on the other. The numbers game means if you got 20 meetings, you need to have 40 or 60 probably to get a term sheet. And then in terms of the numbers game, your numbers just might be too small for them to really get excited about. Mm-hmm. And so that's the thing that I, you can solve the first part pretty easily. Just keep adding you know, emails to the top of the funnel and following up with people who don't, who don't reply. Um, and there's a trick there. When you reply to, if you, if you're going to send a second email, put some information about the growth that occurred since the last one, mm-hmm. because this will show that you're not going away. I'm not going to stop emailing you and I'm not going to stop growing this business. There is nothing better than a headstrong, persistent entrepreneur who is dogged, mm-hmm. resilient, and has grit because we know as investors that if you're dogged and you have that grit and you're resilient, that you're going to be a great steward of the capital we give you on behalf of our LPs, which in some cases include endowments and people curing cancer. We want to see you really take that seriously. And we live in a world where a lot of founders are not taking this work very seriously. I'll be candid. And it's not just the founders. There's a lot of investors not taking the work seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, as a matter of fact, I have investors who are like, why do you do so much? Like, tone it down? Like making us look bad to our LPs. You're right. working too hard. Um, so in that, in that follow-up email, if you grew revenue in the 20 days since they, uh, last contacted you by 15% in just 20 days, because you unlocked a new feature and you put 
a little movie or animated GIF in the email and the chart. Hey, here's the growth since the last time I emailed you. Would love to stay in touch, get a quick coffee. Right. Um, you got to be persistent like that. Mm -hmm. What's the revenue for 2019 going to be, ballpark? Uh, for this year, call it 40 grand. Okay. And last three months of the year? Uh, let's call it uh, 14. Great. So uh, you're making about five grand a month? Yeah. And it's been, it's, it's admittedly been a little lumpy. We've had months as great as, you know, 27K, and we've had months yeah. where we're like, you know, sub $1,000. So the way a, uh, an investor would evaluate your company is it's a perfect company to just wait and see. Mm -hmm. Because most of us are going to look at it and go, it's like a service based business. Mm -hmm. They have you, you inventory of this stuff, the we furniture? Do. Yep. So it's like capital intensive. They got a bunch of inventory, they rent it. Where's the technology here? Where's the massive sea change? in how consumers behave. And I don't think you can answer those. Mm -hmm. We have built some of that technology and essentially that's what powers the service itself. So essentially the user experience on this is that you can go on your phone, press a few buttons and the rest of this just sort of happens in the background. And as I said- the, Yeah, the, in, in 2019, that's probably not considered like impressive technology. Sure, kind of, it's, right? it's not like yeah. it's augmented reality or machine learning or yeah. something. So building a website or an app that lets you rent furniture is not inspiring on a technological level. So if it's not inspiring on a technology level, how could it be inspiring to investors? The margin, right? Uh, repeat customers mm -hmm. and growth rate. So I think you just need to understand what they're looking for. If a business isn't a hardcore tech, it better have hardcore uh, consumer love and a hardcore consumer uh, customer acquisition process. Mm -hmm. So I think you can win on that as well. So you're going to have to figure out what it is you can win on and what you're never going to win on. Sure. You're never going to win on the technology of right. this. Airbnb didn't win on technology. I mean, you could literally rebuild Airbnb right now with Shopify and mm -hmm. a Squarespace site and you know Zapier and a couple of other tools and right. you'll be up and running. Like literally anybody in this room is qualified this weekend to recreate Airbnb's website. Little to be done. I mean, I'm sure there might be some sophisticated stuff on the margins, but generally 95% complete. Mm -hmm. So what is their business? Well, managing that marketplace. Mm -hmm. And your business is really about acquiring those customers and delighting them and making sure you have a great margin. Right. Um, and it just doesn't feel like a tech startup. So you're going to have to prove it with numbers. Okay. How do, so I guess the chicken and egg problem I'm having is how do you get those numbers to go up and to the right when you have to still buy inventory, which requires the capital? Yeah, this is probably, you're, you're what's called an asset heavy marketplace as opposed to an asset light one. Mm -hmm. I would call 10 furniture creators and say, we have an affluent clientele who owns multiple homes and they like to try new furniture um, and they might actually like to try to buy. We'll handle letting them rent it and then they might want to buy it at the end. Would you be interested in doing that and collaborating with us at a discount? Mm -hmm. That's the only thing I can think of. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing people do is they you could sell people on the service uh, and have them put down six months down mm -hmm. and that would help you with cash flow. And cash flow. Yeah. And if they own a home, most of the is your target is your ideal customer profile such that they own the home? Uh, more that they're renters. Uh, so we've oh, so it's with, more renters than yeah, owners. We've worked with property managers to kind of unlock that model, just as yeah. a cheaper way to do customer acquisition. But in that case, they're all wanting to say, "Hey, if I were to send you all these customers, can you fulfill it?" So we've done the pre-sale part. We have actually a, a big deal lined up already to do that with a property manager with three thousand units. But again, you have to promise them on that. Hey, you know. If we don't you know, go and send these customers to you, you're like, you know, we don't want to look bad either that you guys can't actually fulfill the deal. Yeah, this just might be one of those businesses where you need to have a pile of cash yeah. to inventory this stuff mm -hmm. and then it makes it very difficult. That's why most people are intrigued more by asset light mm -hmm. type situations. So if you could do the arbitrage on that, that, that might be a better way to do it is mm -hmm. to try to figure out, hey, we're going to we're not going to inventory anything, but we're going to go to our local community, find all the great furniture right. and then instead of being the owner of the furniture, really the service of getting stuff in and out of your house, mm -hmm. cleaning it, maintaining it, and taking it back is the service. Because mm -hmm. when you talk to your customers, what is their pain point exactly? Uh, their pain point is- it is, money? Um, no, it's actually, I would say it's the flexibility, it's the key value, right? They don't want to be bogged down with something that they then have to move at great expense, or that when they go to their next place, it doesn't work very well. And especially in small footprint type of real estate, you know, like a San Francisco or any other you know, major city like that, you know, if you're off a few inches on the size of certain items, it really screws up a room. 
And on top of that, they have to end up becoming the project manager for all that. They're either scouring Craigslist, they're going to furniture stores, they're you know spending all this money, and it's just it's not a very good user experience. It, it might be that the business you've built is not the business that's going to win. So I'd encourage you if you don't think that this is going to work, which might be why you're not getting investor love, is they're just like I don't believe this business model because I'm looking at it going, can this work? I'm an optimist, and I, I don't see it maybe the way you do. So it might be that this is not the right model. And so you are free at the early stages of your company to completely change your business model. Mm -hmm. If you were starting over today, is there another business model that would work better in your mind? Or is this the greatest business model you can think of? Um, I certainly love the margins. We're doing 54% margins as we are right now. Um, I, if I looked at it and said, if we had the additional capital, we actually have customers to fulfill at this moment. So I'd say there are a lot of indicators that say it's a great business. It's not the only way to skin that cat. I've, looked at it saying, hey, what if we owned none of the inventory, kind of like what you're suggesting? Yeah. There's certainly a play to be made there. It's just that your margins go down. So I wonder if you could get terms from those people who have the furniture. Because mm -hmm. if you told them like, hey, can I pay you half up front for the furniture and then, you know, whatever, uh, a monthly payment for or a quarterly payment for two years. Right. Maybe you could then use them to because they want to move inventory. Right. And their cost, they're marking everything up 50% as well, right? Right. Awesome. Well, good luck with it. Keep us updated at okay. updates at launch.co. Okay. Uh, big round of applause for Trevor. Right. Thanks. Hey, everybody. We're back with our Zap of the Week from Zapier. You know Zapier. It makes you happier. This is the amazing software platform that allows you to connect any two services. Let's say you use MailChimp. Let's say you use Slack. Let's say you use Squarespace. Let's say you use Google Docs. Whatever you use, Zapier is the glue. And one of the things I was super frustrated with was on my blog, I had a mailing list. And on my podcast website, I also had a mailing list. And then every year we'd like kind of cross promote them. And it was a pain in the neck because I know that people reading my blog care about the podcast. And I know podcast listeners always want to read my blog. And this is our zap of the week. If people sign up for either one of these services, you can see here, Fresh, who's my associate in charge of growth, he has it mutually subscribe people to both lists. Now, what's the beauty of this? Well, if somebody doesn't like the podcast by chance or isn't interested in getting it, or they don't like the blog, if they unsubscribe from one, they're still on the other. So it makes it just nice and easy. You could integrate leads with your CRM or spreadsheet. That's a killer function. And there's 1,500 business applications. If you make a business application, if you make anything in SaaS, one of the first check boxes you do is making it work with Zapier. It's so great. And you can build the exact solution you need in minutes, sometimes seconds, without writing code or needing a developer. And that's the key. The way we used to do this before Zapier, everything was not as good. So I want you to go to zapier.com slash twist and connect the applications you use most. Just get in there. Join more than 4.5 million people who are saving an average of 40 hours a month by using Zapier. And that's really what it's about. When you're a startup, you have limited resources, you need to automate stuff. Anything that takes more than an hour or two a month, that's something that qualifies for you to spend your time no coding with Zapier. Right now through February, try Zapier free by going to our special link, Zapier, Z-A-P-I-E-R dot com slash twist. Z-A-P-I-E-R dot com slash twist. Get your 14-day trial now for free. Zapier, it makes you happier. Okay, let's get back to this program. Okay, next up is Jellica. Yeah. Jellica, I got it. I have never heard that name before, Jellica. Does it have a meaning in the world? Yeah, my mom actually danced on Broadway, and she was pregnant with me when she was in Cats. And so there's a song called Jellico Cats, ah. and then it inspired my name. Yeah. Wow. That was a great story. Thanks. <laughs> now and forever. Yeah. Was that at the Winter Theater in Manhattan? Do you remember? No. Sorry. I went to see it. It was? It was. The Winter, yeah. The Winter Garden. I can remember the commercials from the '80s. Um, they would well, come out. There's they a would, movie about it too, so it's. A good yeah, I'm definitely not seeing the movie. No, it's mom. But um, actually, now that I think about it, I have three daughters. I am going to see the movie. <laughs> I'm going to begrudgingly see the movie. Um, all right. Uh, so you have a company called Saddle Shop. Yep. And it's an online retailer selling luxury equestrian equestrian clothing and gear. I remember we had met previously, mm -hmm. um, and. You sell things like saddles? We don't. We actually rebranded recently. Okay. Um, so now it's just called EQ. Okay. 
Uh, so it's a marketplace for equestrians, and we, and we still focus on the lifestyle component of it. The biggest reason we rebranded is because of this, the saddle question, hmm. and it didn't make sense anymore. Yeah. So what do you sell at EQ? We sell um, high-end clothing for the equestrian industry specifically. So we focus on brands that are often really hard to find in the United States or abroad, uh, mostly because the industry still operates like it's the 80s. So you'll find someone who, like a, a retailer, has a brick-and-mortar shop, but they don't have like an online store. So maybe you meet them one time at an event and you found this really great shirt that's like cotton viscose, which means that it's cotton that breathes when you sweat and like moves with you it's really hard to find them again and to also find that brand. Uh, oftentimes because the brands don't have a direct relationship with the consumer and they're reliant on the existing retailers to do that work. Um, I started the company because as a consumer, I thought it was incredibly hard to go find these things. So you'd have yeah. to spend so like It's a niche driving. product mm -hmm. and it's hard to find. Um, and so do you, what is your biggest challenge? So we're bootstrapped, and I would say our biggest challenge right now is scaling. Um, we moved to the marketplace model because kind of like what you were talking about before with the guy from Movin, um, it was really hard to scale with having all this inventory on hand because it was basically like 80% of our capital sat in inventory. Um, and we were moving it pretty quickly, like within 45 days, but we can't really continue to scale at that rate if we have capital, if it's just sitting and hanging out. Um so I think right now our problem is like, how do we scale and get to leak two to 300 brands on the site where we've, we've, we've got about almost 5,000 customers um, and the average purchase rate is about $986 or purchase price is about $986. So from that perspective, we're doing great, but then we just decreased our margins slightly. So, so you drop ship from other vendors now? They ship to us and then we ship to the customer. Ah. Uh, the main point is like, in part, they don't really want a relationship with the customer. And then also you have to deal with, um, like, a lot of times, like, just customs. Ah. So e-commerce is a brutally hard business, as you know. You have a niche, so that's good. And the ticket price is bonkers. Um, on a $1,000 average spend, what is the profit in there? Is it 20%, 30% with returns and with shipping? Yeah, with a marketplace, it's about 30%. Um, as I'd like to, if we actually end up because we do have a pop-up with uh, Simon Malls. So we, we launched a partnership with them so that we can actually compete in the brick and mortar space as well. Um, so for that product, our margin sits at 57%. Got it. So that seems like a better business is to cohabitate in somebody else's space and, and sort of have a stand there or something. Yeah. Well, interesting. So um, it's difficult to scale a business like this um, to venture scale, obviously. Very few people have done it. If they do do it, it's typically because they're doing something direct to consumer where they actually make the product. And the premise and the promise of direct to consumer is that the person will be so obsessed with that niche product, whether it's you know a Peloton or uh, an Away bag or the electric toothbrush company, Quip, Quip, Quip yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole premise of those is they're so much better that consumers can't shut up about them. That is modestly interesting to investors. Investors are like, yeah, they're, they're not sure on D to C. I'll just leave it at that. The, the jury is out on if investors think this is a good investment, even with Dollar Shave Club selling for a billion and you know the sous vide company selling. It, it's really not uh, considered a, a venture category by a lot of people. Um, and scaling when you're while bootstrapping I, the best advice I would have is going after the high end of the market. By definition, everything you do is the high end of the market. So I think what you have to ask yourself is, why do I want to scale this business? What is the goal here? Is that a question? Or can I well, question? What, are, you're, what are you growing year over year? Uh, so 2018 I, to 2019, what were the two revenue numbers? So in 2018, we did 325. And then this year, we should hit a million. Great. So you're tripling and it's not good enough for you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I, I, Business development background. Yeah. I mean, I, I like think money. you should not change what you're doing mm -hmm. and continue to get laser focused on owning a deep relationship with those customers and just getting to five or 10,000 of them. You have 5,000 that have paid so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would just try to see what the renewal rates on them, you know, repeat purchases are on them. Yeah. 
And I would not worry if you're tripling year over year or even growing 50% and you control the cap table and you don't have any venture investors, you don't, right? Nobody's breathing no. down your neck. No. I, I think you're doing it exactly right. Okay. Permission granted to do what you're doing. <laughs> so a lot of people in this room are not tripling their revenue to a million dollars this year. Yeah. I mean, I think for us, it's about like we've gotten to a point where the capital that's coming in, the, the revenue that's coming in and then kind of like the output of the just general overhead of like retail in general, like even if it's just still in the marketplace model becomes a little bit tricky to manage, especially when you do, then need, because the more customers require it, the more people we need to have to actually either fulfill those, fulfill those orders or deal with customer happiness or anything like that. Um, and so it's, it's become like a, a point of where like, where does the chicken and the egg happen? Um, especially from like the growth perspective, because there's only so much capital that like, you know, I've personally put into the business or my co-founders put into the business. When and you start to like hit limited. a million dollars in runway, you start to unlock um, some um, lines of credit and factoring and that kind of stuff. So you might want to, have you looked into that yet? A little bit. Yeah. But it's also kind of like on the million dollar, well, when do you hit a million? And then and then they'll actually unlock it versus yeah. now they're just like, oh, do you want like $25,000? And you're like, that's not going to do anything. Yeah. 25 well, doesn't do anything. Um, I think if you found investors who were super excited about Equestrian, um, that is one potential unlock. If you want to raise capital, mm -hmm. one there's two different ways to go at this. One is just grow the business as best you can and don't try to compete on a venture basis right now. Just try to compete on how much you can delight your customer basis. This way you're not setting a goal of like you're setting a goal of being like an astronaut without having a rocket ship, like kind of a prerequisite. Like this business might just be like a jet airliner or something, you know, like it may not need to go to space to be an incredible business. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe slow down your expectation. You said you were going to triple into next year or triple, you tripled 2018 to 2019. We trip, we'll triple into next year. Yeah. Um, Maybe, and I never tell people this, but if you're unfunded, like uh, maybe just keep doing what you're doing and get to seven, 800K. Uh, don't put the business in financial jeopardy and just work on the margin. And if the margins are really great, then the spending will be very organic. Like you'll be able to take those profits and just increase your spending on acquiring customers, right? Mm -hmm. So either you should get the jet fuel and build a rocket ship or you should, you know, ride a bicycle. It's like two very different things. Like one of them has jet fuel and one of them doesn't. I don't recommend putting like jet fuel on the back of a bicycle. That sounds like a bad idea. It's a really bad idea. I mean, this, <laughs> and there's YouTube videos of people doing it. <laughs> um, rest in peace. Um, <laughs> people do stupid shit on YouTube. It's kind of like one of the top three categories. <laughs> Unboxing toys, attempting to kill yourself, <laughs> and crying, being emo. Um, so continued success with it. Uh, I would. The thing I also like about your business is I think you have a lot of optionality. Um, those people who do equestrian stuff, like they are like wearing that equestrian shit on their private jets too. They are. I've seen it. Yeah, we have a couple I'm of like, customers like that. What are you doing? What's that outfit? <laughs> Why do you have like knee pads on your pants and <laughs> like it's like collars and? It's a look. It's a whole look. It's a look that's been around for like 100 years. It's kind of crazy. People are dressing like they're going to polo when they're Not. just going to like the polo lounge. Mm -hmm. This is bonkers. Yeah. All the time. All the time. So we find like a lot of our customers too kind of like overlap of like kind of to your point of someone who maybe who doesn't even ride, but they, they like the look. So maybe they're like an Hermes customer or they're like a Neiman Market, Marcus customer and they just want to be a part of this club that seems super exclusive. So yeah. that's like where it's really helped us grow into like the larger customer bracket. And you don't have your own EQ branded merch yet? No. Or products? Because it kind of goes into like having enough cash to do that because yeah. it's, it's very cash intensive to create a, your own brand. If you know the space really well, this isn't when I talk about optionality, there, if you can keep growing at a decent pace, 50% year over year or whatever, you're going to find other opportunities to build high margin products. So I would look at what your highest margin pro products are. If they are you know, the jackets, mm -hmm. maybe pausing for a second and say, what would be the most kick-ass jacket I could ever build? And doing a short run of them and then finding somebody who is 
Is there like a Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant or LeBron James or Steph Curry of Equestrian? Yeah. I wonder if you could find that person mm -hmm. and say, I want to make a collection around you. Would you be willing to do that with me in a partnership? We both will contribute 50% to the cost of doing it. You will promote it. I'll promote it. And then we'll split the returns 50-50 and make a high-end brand for that person. Yeah. It's something like, that's what I mean by like, don't be super disappointed in a nice growing business. Be creative and run some tests on top of it. That might be the ultimate test. If you could make a series of outfits based upon who the most legendary person in equestrian is, which no, nobody here knows. Kaylee Cuoco is actually really big. Kelly Cuoco. She's the girl on oh, Priceline. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. yeah. How's she doing? I'm joking. I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Raise your hand if you know the person she's talking about. Okay. So there are your six customers. <laughs> Raise your hand if you've ridden a horse in the last three months. <laughs> last year. In the last 12 months, have you ridden a horse? Right. So it's like this is a niche of a niche of a niche, right? And it doesn't surprise me we're in a city. But if we did this in Montana, the two-thirds would yeah, I'd have to ask the idea. opposite. Who hasn't been on a horse? Yeah. <laughs> in the last... Who didn't come here on a horse? <laughs> um, so anyway, I think that might be the way to do it. Does that person make a lot of money? I'm curious. She does. She's a billionaire. Because she has all this money from, like, she was on, um, yeah, the Big Bang Theory. So she has, oh, like, okay. lots of money. Th this is not, like, she's passionate about it and she's rich from some other thing. What I'm talking about, is there, like, a, is there somebody in the sport mm -hmm. who is the Michael Jordan of it, who puts up the most points? Yes. Um, people, people come out for. Yeah. So, like, our closest connection would be um, Mavis Spencer, who's, like, um, I can't remember her mother's name. No but, problem. Uh, anyways famous actress mom and um do these people make money or lose money doing the sport <laughs> they actually make money so like for example you'll buy a horse let's say for like 50 to 100k and then over the course of maybe having that horse for like three to five years um that horse could become like a 500 to like million dollar horse to part per to sell because it's been trained so well and another person who's not naturally gifted in polo can then take the horse in? Yeah, essentially. Like, they get, it trains, it competes, it wins things, and then that ups the value of it. And then it, as long as it's healthy, it'll sell for six figures easily. Yeah. So anyway, now Sorry. in my mind, I've got 15 more ideas, but we're <laughs> out of time. Um, but think about the current business mm -hmm. as a steady state growing at whatever percentage. Um and then I would think of maybe one or two tests to run of things that could be super high margin and see if you can become a Pegasus where you have some high margin jacket that you make, you know, that you sell for $2,000 that has this person's branding on it. It costs you 600 to make and you just sell them out every time in batches of 100 limited editions and you change them for the next batch. They're handcrafted. Do something like that and see if you can come up with a couple of product ideas that become high margin. Cool. Let's give her a big round of applause. Well Thanks. done. Listen, in 2018, VCs invested a total of $100 billion in the United States. But did you know there is a $1.7 trillion asset class that is uncorrelated with public equities and has outperformed the S&P? And there's no institutional investors allocating to it. Think about this for a second. What category is this? Uncorrelated with public equities, outperformed the S&P, and has no institutional investors allocating to it. Masterworks.io is the first company to allow any type of investor, whether retail or accredited, to gain exposure to blue chip artwork. This year, roughly 68 billion in art will trade hands between collectors around the globe. You know this, you hear people talking about it and you see the headlines. Deloitte estimates the size of the blue chip artwork asset class to be 1.7 trillion. All of these transactions are between individuals. Think about that. There is no way to invest in this asset class unless you purchase a painting, right? That's kind of a bummer. You're going to buy this painting. How do you know which one to buy? What do you do with it once you get it? Masterworks.io is changing everything by being the first platform to file paintings with the SEC. In the same process that a company goes public, they are taking Masterworks artworks and making them go public. What a brilliant idea. And then they sell shares in these artworks to individuals, me, you, everybody else. Masterworks has 30,000 investors signed up and using its platform. That is unbelievable. So here's your call to action. I want you to go to i.masterworks.io slash twist to skip the 5,000 person wait list. That's right, i.masterworks.io 
io slash twist okay let's get back to this amazing episode okay next up is antonio he is from you can event an event services marketplace we've seen many of those with social sharing content generation uh how long have you been running you can event since may 2017 great so it's been around for just over two years yeah and have you raised money for it Two hundred and thirty-five thousand yeah. dollars, and how much revenue will you generate in twenty nineteen on this marketplace? A uh, hundred and eighty. Congratulations! And, almost, and it, yeah. it's a marketplace. So is that your take, or is that the GMV? The, the, the take. That's your take. Yeah. What is the take rate? What percentage of every transaction in your marketplace? Eighteen percent. You take eighteen yeah. percent. A very low amount. Yeah. When compared to the 30% Apple takes or the 45% YouTube takes, um, but a small amount when compared to what Stripe takes uh, or what Patreon takes, 5%, I think. Yeah. Uh, so what is your biggest challenge? And congratulations on a very capital efficient run to date. Thank you so much. Uh, to be honest with you is operations management. So my team, it's like, is me, uh, I do all the biz diving, UX design and 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 growth, and my co-founder and CTO, he's doing now operations, and it's like we are in the process just in looking now for an operations person, and we want to automate as much as we can the processes, and find those uh, orders and 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 products in the marketplace that are easily to kind of like coordinate logistically speaking cookie cutter repeatable yeah repeatable exactly to scale faster yeah so part of most people say it's fine to do things that are not repeatable in the early days of the company and then slowly automate them so you can look at whatever tasks you're doing that take too much time and are too complex and either remove them in other words if something what's the most complicated arduous back and forth for event production Right now, yeah. Right Which category or service? Yeah, right now it's actually audiovisual. Got it. AV yeah. is the most AV. complex. Yeah. Great. So there's two ways. Oh, for you and to... venues, of course. Uh, yeah. But venues uh, yeah. tend to be pretty simple. Yeah. When compared to AV. Yeah, with AV it's more complex. Yeah. So there's two ways for you to go about this. One is to come up with packages, yeah. and say here's a standard package A, B, or C. A can include up to this many microphones up to this many speakers, up to this many cameras, or no cameras. Plan B is to have basic camera setup, plan C is this, and then just get the people on the other side to agree that you're selling a very concise package. When you used to leave Kennedy Airport in New York and you had to get to Manhattan, you had two choices. One was to wait online, and there was a big yellow cab line, and number two was to talk to one of 50 drivers who were essentially like hosting a bazaar <laughs> in the uh, luggage pickup area. Yeah. And I would, when I was young, I'd just say, "Go, I'm, I'm going to lower Manhattan, 20 bucks. Guy would say 40, I'd say 20. He'd say 30, I'd say 20. He'd say, I can't do it. Then some other guy would come up and say, I'll do it for 20. I'd say, okay, I'll go through it. Then the guy would say, I'll do it for 20. <laughs> and I was like, well, he, or he was the first to commit to 20 and I'm going with him. And I just hand him the 20 bucks in cash and we go. Interesting. And then they would take you in what essentially was an Uber X. Hmm. An unlicensed cab. In, the, yeah. in New York, they called them gypsy cabs. <laughs> um, I don't think I can say that anymore. Um, can you say the word gypsy cab? Somebody check. No? No chance. No chance, right? All right. I'm sorry. Twitter, you got what you wanted. You can now cancel me. I used the word gypsy cab. But I don't think they were gypsies ri driving them. I think it was just a colloquialism. Yeah. But anyway, you, you, you'd, you'd haggle with a gypsy cab and you, you get home. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thanks, Mom. She always laughs at my jokes. Uh, so that's that's the two strategies, right? Yeah. It's either eliminate it and don't do that and just focus on the venues. Mm -hmm. Because getting in between things that are too complex, it's problematic. Exactly. So either cancel that part of the business or maybe do the package thing and say for package. more complex stuff, uh, we charge $500 to do a consultation with you. So if you said you can pick one of these four AV packages or you can work with one of our team members it's $500 for a consultation or $100 for a consultation. Then you would weed out the looky-loos mm. who are using you for free research and they're going to go do it themselves, right? Which is what I do. For years, I used to hire AV companies 
and I would ask them to itemize, itemize, to put the model number, the serial number of the equipment on the thing. And then I eventually figured out how they did everything, and I bought all the equipment myself. I feel you. And they're like, yeah, yeah, no, no, it's $2,000 a day for a camera operator. I was like, well, what if you get a robotic camera like those? And they're like, oh, yeah, we don't do that. And I'm like, oh, okay. And I was like, then I got the robotic cameras. So I was like, okay, well, we, now we don't have to hire three camera operators for every time we do an event because that would cost literally $2,000 a day each. Um, so that's a way for you to add a level of like consulting and qualification if it's not cookie cutter. Have you thought about that? Yeah, so we are actually launching now event packages, but it's more like, you know, because our, our added value is when you book event services through us, we yeah. also help you build community. So we send an event assistant that takes pictures and makes videos of the event huh. and later creates content for Great. social sharing. And it's like right now we are creating packages more for the type of event that you want to do, like networking events, fireside chats, uh, social yeah. happy hours. Event in a box. Exactly. More like that. So we might do also packages for the category like LUV. It's a great idea. Like if you knew what the top categories were and you had engagement party uh, and you're like, here, just tell us what you, here's what this would cost. Here's like type A party, type B, type C. And type C is in like a fancy yeah. location. Type A is in a, you know, more rustic, affordable value and B somewhere yeah. in between. And selling those packages and then having a consulting fee on top of them could solve the problem. Mm. I just, I'm kind of like scared on just saying that consulting thing because it might slow us down and remove us from the focus of scaling. And, and Yeah, I'm not the, advocating the for doing it for all categories. Yeah. Only the categories that are so complex that it takes okay. it in, because your question originally was like, yeah, yeah. it's really inefficient. Yeah. So if something is super inefficient, okay. you just charge a consulting fee on it. When I used to install local area networks and for you know people like Bear Stearns or giant law firms, if they wanted to contract us to architect it, we'd say, we can architect the whole thing for you, give you the architecture document for $40,000, and then you can take that and build it yourself and hire your own people. Or we can uh, bid out the job and uh, it'll be $150,000. So you pick. Mm. Do you want a report or do you want this? And they're like, oh, I just have some questions. And they're like, yeah, that would be the report mm. format. We would do the analysis. Oh, what, what routers would you use? How would you solve this problem? Like, get the, if, you, if it takes more than whatever I number of, it. in yeah. this case, it would be like, if it takes more than the initial meeting, to get the business is probably not worth you educating the customer. So I always like to challenge the customer. So for things that are super challenging, like AV, maybe have a consultation and there's a fee okay. for it. Makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Good luck with it. Sounds like you're in the right direction. Big round of applause for Antonio. If you average eight hours of sleep a night, which I do, and you eat a quality plant-based diet like I do, and you exercise more than four times a week, which I'm trying to do, you are doing everything right and you're gonna live a long life. It's proven. Isn't it time that you got rewarded for putting in that effort? I know I wanna be rewarded for that and that's where Health IQ comes in. They use science and data to secure lower life insurance rates for people like you. Health IQ can save you up to, get ready for this, 41%. Because physically active people have significantly lower risk of heart disease, cancer, and the big one, diabetes, right? We all know people who've been impacted by that. Health IQ is not just a lead generator. They don't just take your name and send it to a bunch of people, no. They take customers through an entire application process and they went through it, it's brilliant. And the policy is underwritten by one of their top insurance partners. So you answer questions and then you get a better deal. These savings are exclusive to Health IQ. You won't find them anywhere else. They pioneered this space. They're the only people doing it. So here's your call to action. Find out if you qualify as elite by taking as little as 20 minutes to save up to 41%. We all know life insurance is so expensive. It's so expensive. Saving 41% is big, big money. So it's worth taking that 20 minutes. And you are going to do that by going to healthiq.com slash twist. H-E-A-L-T-H-I-Q dot com slash twist. I don't need to spell it for you. You know how it's spelled. Again, that's healthiq.com slash twist to start the process with the Health IQ quiz. There is no commitment and you'll learn more about the opportunities to be rewarded for your commitments to living healthy. Go there now. Healthiq.com slash twist. One more time. Healthiq.com slash twist. And uh, welcome to the podcast, Health IQ. I know I met with the team. I was blown away by the product. It's a service I've been waiting. And I said, why doesn't this exist in the world? And you made it. So that's the power of founders. That's the power of the teams they bring together. 
And this is really going to change the world. I'm really excited about it. Okay, let's get back to this amazing episode. All right, we're back on Office Hours. I do this 20 times a year. Try to meet a dozen founders and help them workshop whatever their toughest, uh, most challenging problems are. And you know what? If you do that 250 times a year, you start to see patterns. You start to see the same questionings happening over and over again. Uh, and hopefully we can help these founders maybe 10%, 20%, maybe even 100% to solve whatever their most pressing problem is. Next up is Pickle. Uh, and Ozzy is the founder. It is a B2B data platform of some type. And his challenge is acquiring national customers outside of SoCal. So getting the bigger non-local customers. What is Pickle, in your own words, in as basic a way as you could frame it? Uh, we're a platform where we gather global product data for brands and retailers using everyday grocery shoppers instead of a workforce. So anything you want to see within 24 hours, like the Uber of retail visibility. Okay, so that makes little sense to anybody listening. Let's try saying it even simpler. Are you paying people to go take pictures of produce and prices and then selling it to a competitor? Uh, we, we pay grocery shoppers $5 to take photos of products in stores. That then goes to the brand or the retailer so they can take action immediately to do whatever needs to be done. Great. So an example might be I'm Pepsi and I go in and I take pictures of Coca-Cola's products. And then on the back end, Coca-Cola gets to see how those products are being displayed and at what price and then counter whatever they're doing. It's not necessarily focused directly on competition, okay. but it could be one example. Or let's just say Jason's Cookies just got into all the Whole Foods or Targets in San Francisco. Right. And you want to know right now, are my three cookies on the shelf, second from the top, $3 each, and maybe by the registers. Hmm. So you'd blast it out to a network of grocery shoppers who have an app on their phone. Anyone right. can do it, high school to senior citizen. They just pop some photos. They make $5 in five minutes. And then the brand or the retailer. How, how many action. SKUs do they have to go take pictures of to make the five dollars? Uh, the brand chooses the kinds of photos they want. Right now, it's four they can choose, and the shopper can take an additional two if they'd like. We've discovered they like to just say, "Hey, maybe Jason wants to see this poster or this cool display Great. going." So on. they take five or six pictures, and they get paid a dollar per picture, and then you sell that data to other brands who have a subscription to you, or do they send people on specific missions? Does it yeah. Work? yeah, so it goes onto their dashboard. It's a three-part system that we built. And so on their dashboard, uh, they can just, in three clicks of a button, they can blast out the request anywhere in the world, and they can just log in and then see their pickle details page. They can see the shopper, how long it took them to do it, all the photos that they need, and then they can take action. What do they do with this data? What, why, why are they paying for this data? So uh, one example you had was, let's say, for competition, but primarily is... You know, 90% of after you get into a store, there's a lot of follow up that's needed, right? Is it the right price? Are we on shelf? What's happening uh, with the displays and caps? A lot of these brands are spending maybe $5,000 a month to put products on sale. So a lot of consumers think, oh, wow, look at that really cool chip display. But that chip display actually cost $10,000 plus they paid to put the chips on sale. So is it is it happening? Is it looking the way it should? Uh, it can. So it's trust but verify is what you're trying to do here for them. They trust that their product and their end cap is being put. End cap is the thing at the end of the aisle. I know that because I've heard this uh, terminology before. And there's a bunch of people doing this. I think hedge funds are also like to buy this data because they want to see, you know, if, you know, how bananas are moving mm -hmm. and what price bananas are so they can trade futures in whatever. Is that right? Yeah. So you have marketing companies, research companies. Uh, you also have quick service restaurants that need to know what's happening. The new Impossible Burgers on the window at McDonald's is it the way it should be. Um, the other interesting thing that happens too. Okay, hold on. Is, yep. What is your biggest challenge now that we've set this up? Yeah. So we in this year we focused on really in Southern California and Beta, right? So we have 265 shoppers, and the challenge is that we have a lot of brands that just want to be national tomorrow. Right. And that that list is growing fast. And so you so, easily get the local brands. You're saying? Well, no. So the brands are most of them are all national. Right. And so they want us to be national. But we focused on Southern California and now we have trinkles in nine states. So we have some people in Texas, a couple people in Ohio, but really the guts in Southern California. So the challenge has been, well, I have brands that are paying. Right. But if I have too many brands and not enough shoppers in the United States that I won't be able to service them. If I have a million or 10 million shoppers, I won't be able to service them. It's hard brands. for you to find shoppers who want to make five bucks taking five photos? Uh, it's not hard to find the shoppers. 
But if I go get a million tomorrow, then I won't have enough for them to do Got it. on the other end. Okay. So, oh, you have the chicken and egg problem of not having enough data to sell international. I don't have enough of the manpower of the yeah. shoppers out there, right? Got it. You don't have enough staff to do that. Got it. So there is a very simple solution to this, which is to find the most well-heeled customer and say, we want to take this national. We want you to be the anchor customer. Mm -hmm. um, and in exchange for having the exclusive in the serial space, we will not allow any customers to buy this data uh, for 2020. Mm -hmm. And you will get all the data on serial and have an exclusive for a year in, in exchange for giving us $250,000 up front. Is that something you might be interested in? Mm -hmm. And then see what the reaction is. Right. So one of the great tricks that founders uh, do all the time is they get customers to fund their product development or their business's development. And there's somebody out there, Procter & Gamble, mm -hmm. whoever, mm -hmm. who would really like to have uh, access to that data. Right. Another way to do it is when you sell the data to people, say, we're going to sell you this data uh, for this price and then have the VIP program, mm -hmm. which then gives you whatever, you know, is worth paying for that isn't in the initial package. Right. So I don't know if that would be video. I don't know if that would be um, uh, the fifth or sixth photo or, or, you know, something like that. So one example for is that, you know, you can hold a pickle for 36 hours. So Jason can hold a pickle and say he's going to go to Whole Foods tomorrow and do the pickle, right? I now know that Jason is going into that store in the next 36 hours. Yeah. When does a retailer ever know that someone's coming to their store? They don't. So at scale, if I have 100 million people, I, I can call Target and say, I have a million people coming to your store in the next 24 hours. What do you want to do? So those are some of the, the, the data unlocks that we can start doing yeah. in the future as we grow. Just get your customers to pay in advance for it. That is the easy yeah. solution um, because it's really easy on Craigslist for you to find people to do this. There's a ton of like work from home and gig economy stuff out there. Yeah, like so, I discovered the Beer Money blog, which I was blown away by. I had no idea. People are literally looking to make 10 or 20 bucks once a month to pay for their booze. I don't know why you're judging me so harshly, Ozzy. <laughs> I, I heard about you from them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I like beer. Right. I'm sorry. I like free beer. There's no such thing as free beer. Listen, I'm intrigued. Uh, by your business. Uh, I would love to hear more about it. What's revenue going to be this year, you think, 2019? Uh, so it, we went into beta in February, 15K. For total? Total. Got it. Uh, prototype was 2018, $972. Got it. So I would keep doing it and charge more. It sounds like there is a lot of value here. I keep charging more money for it. Make sense? You, yes. You're going to say something else? You want to follow up? I, I can say uh, like a lot, but I don't want to. No, go ahead. Yeah. So, I mean, how... We're really staying focused on delivering that one service really, really well, like super fast, right? Yep. A shopper can pick it up and complete it anywhere, and a brand can three clicks get whatever they want within 24 hours, right? Yep. Without the capacity to start unlocking all these other data layers, how can you start charging more now if you if it's in the future, right? And I think one yeah, struggle is Yeah, I think the like, VIP access is the way to do it, is to say to them, we plan to roll out to 20 cities. If you join the VIP program, which is 5000 a month, you will see the data in real time and you'll see the raw feed. And you'll have access to pickle, you know, um, feed.pickle.com or if they were J&J, &J, it'd be jj.pickle, whatever it is, some mm -hmm. URL. Go to this URL. Everybody on your team can see in real time us adding the photos and boom. They get something extra. Mm -hmm. And so in the industry... Um, I remember I was at a board meeting for Dyne and they sell oh. Dyne, D-Y-N.com. It's a DNS routing infrastructure company. I said, you know, who's the biggest customer? They said the name of the customer. They said how much they were spending was like 1500 a month. I'm like, is there a product where they can spend 15000 a month with us? And they're like, no. I'm like, well, just create a bottle service type situation. And they're like, what are you talking about? I was like, you know how like a bottle of vodka is $100? Like the big one? Mm. Like of Absolute or whatever you're getting, Grey Goose? And you know, there's a club where they charge 600 for it. Do you know why that costs more money? Status. Right. It's being brought to you by some beautiful person with sprinklers and mm -hmm. fireworks and they put on the ding mm -hmm. and everybody goes crazy. Wow, this person can afford to spend $500 extra on a $100 bottle of vodka. Wow, they must be important. Or I, I look at them, they must be stupid. Status. Um, <laughs> but what they did is they made a tier that had greater resiliency, 
greater access to customer support, et cetera. So getting them to pay you to be part of the national rollout and to see the data in real time and to comment and ask questions in real time, that might yeah. un unlock them paying in advance for a year. For Just try it. Yeah. Come up with a product that costs $250,000 a year, mm -hmm. and that is going to blow their mind. Now that you've tinkered here, you tinkered, right? Well, I'd call it more than tinkering, but... We got to fifteen grand. We, we did, yeah. yeah. It's tinkering in my world. Right. No offense. No offense taken. Yeah. I mean, you're tinkering, you're testing stuff. Yeah, yeah. Let's come up with a product that really changes their world and costs a quarter million dollars a year. Because, right. by the way, a quarter million dollars a year to the people we're talking about means nothing. Why, well, if, if I get 400 anything brands... Anything under yeah. a million is free. It's, it, it is nothing because we had brands that were paying a quarter of a million to half a million just for Southern California and services per month. And I was doing 20 brands, right? right? So 250 a year nationally or globally is nothing. You get 400 brands like that and that's it. Yeah, so what so, you do is you say, you get to be part of the beta. And, right. and I would literally just do that with 30 people and see if you can get two to say yes. Mm -hmm. Then you become a Pegasus. You can not right. raise money. You can raise money from your clients. Right. All right, great job. Let's hear it up. Let's hear it for Ozzy. Good job. All right, next up is John Tay. Did I pronounce your name correct? That's correct. John Tay. Uh, and he has a company called Nature Track, T R A K. That's correct. And you do compliance automation uh, connecting cannabis companies with banks in a two sided marketplace. It's accurate description? That sums it up. Great. So, cannabis companies um, have a lot of compliance issues and banking issues. Summarize for the class what, as briefly as you can, what is the core issue that cannabis companies are dealing with when it comes to banks and compliance? No, absolutely. Um, the biggest challenge um, facing the legal cannabis industry is the regulatory burden on the financial institutions, right? So at the federal level, cannabis is still illegal. State level, they're able to operate. So... Within the state laws, like California, for instance, all the cannabis companies or the operators must operate under that. But then the burden of the financial resources for a bank to jump in is just too costly, right? Because none of the national banks are in it. It's all state chartered or community banks. So if you're Bank of America playing on the national stage, you do not want to be the banker for somebody who's legally selling cannabis in California, lest, you know... Jeff Sessions shows up at your door. Right. <laughs> exactly. So they're hands off. So they find out you're in. Which would be pretty terrorizing under any circumstance, <laughs> now that I think about it. Uh, so let me ask a really stupid question. Why aren't there regional local banks that pop up just to serve this need? In other words, why doesn't someone like Bank of America start the bank of just California? Or well, the bank of just cannabis recreational states? Right. Well, I mean, there's a lot of people that are trying to do that. It's there a are? little bit harder to get a charter and, and get into that. So, I mean, essentially what our system and what our company allows them to do is become the bank of cannabis. And that's what we've provided to the credit unions and the state charter banks that we're servicing now. Got it. So your customer is? The bank. The bank, the, the government-backed bank, and you sell them what? So we sell them risk management services. Got it. What does that mean in plain English? Plain English means we let them know where the fraud is in the money. So one of the big problems with the cannabis money actually coming in is the legacy cash, right? So Wait, are you saying you're a snitch? I'm not a snitch. I protect them. I'm ghost. Stitches are for snitchers. Be careful. <laughs> Just saying. Um, so drilling down here, you know that this cannabis person, this cannabis retailer, or wholesaler, that their money's clean and not coming from the streets, but coming through uh, a licensed uh, dispensary. That's correct. So, How do you do that? So we essentially became a data aggregator. Um, we integrate into all the softwares that they're using. So their inventory management softwares, warehouse management, POS, logistics, you name it. We're aggregating into that data. Then we integrate into the core banking system. And so as transactions are starting to come through, we're able to then hold or flag those transactions that don't meet our fraud engine. Got it. So you're a compliance company that helps the banks make sure they are not dealing with somebody doing Fugazi stuff. 
That's correct. Great. What is your biggest challenge? Our biggest challenge right now is um, which direction do we go? We have so many opportunities that people are pulling at us. And how do we stay really, really focused, laser focused, right? The bank is our client, but the sales cycle for a bank is very long. Yeah. They don't adopt, you know, SaaS solutions or anything overnight. It's a three, six, sometimes a year process. Yet we still have the cannabis companies that are clamoring for bank accounts. And we make revenue off of that side as well. Then there's other you know, payment processors or other um, legitimate industries that need access to these operators, which we can provide compliance for. So as we're trying to scale, it's like, who do we focus on? We really focus on the banks. That's going to take us three, four, five years to really get there. Do we stay, you know, vigilant on handling a group of cannabis clients, maybe, you know, call them tier one clients that are doing 10, $20 million a year and helping them get all their money in the bank rather than just a portion of the money in the bank and make well, money off of that. That's a stupid question, but where are they keeping all this cash? In vaults. <laughs> they literally have vaults at the, at the dispensaries. Yes. Is this creating a security issue? Oh, it's a huge security issue. Um, so we're in, we're based in Cal, um, Sacramento right now. So we were in San Jose. Now we're in Sacramento. And one That's of the a biggest, big trend, by the way, a lot of people are going to Sactown. It's awesome. It's it's um, you know Silicon Valley East now. It is because it's halfway to <laughs> Truckee. You got you got a basketball team. That's terrible, just like here. Um, Airports easy to get in out of. Easy guy, but it's a, what is it? An hour and a half, two hours from here. It's a lot of people are doing that arbitrage. So. I like in the early stage you keeping your eyes open for bigger opportunities. A lot of times people come into the industry and they're like, yeah, you know, I want to create a magazine about tech companies. And then they go, maybe I'll create a tech company. And then they go, maybe I'll be an investor in a tech company and that'll be the most lucrative of all these things. And that's a better opportunity for me. And maybe I'll be better at that. That's literally my career path. IT, fixing printers, magazine about tech, entrepreneur creating a startup, and then investor in startups. <laughs> And so you can go that same way. It could be the compliance is interesting. You're helping those banks, maybe creating a compliance tool for them to pay for so they could proactively have a compliance, you know, uh, certification from you and an audit from you that then would help them in the future so they can say, listen, for the last three years, we've been auditing all this. And that's, we don't even have to when we're doing it. Would they do all this compliance work even if they didn't have to? Or do a, um, go above and beyond, as I'm suggesting here? They definitely would go above and beyond. So the example that you used earlier with B of A, they need to know if they're banking cannabis. So they will take those extra steps. Yeah. Um, one of the challenges we do see, see in that is it comes down to the beneficial ownership of the company. Typically, when you're opening up a bank account, you know, you're listing your managing partners who owns, you know, 20% of the company and above, Right. Well, for cannabis, they really want to dig down deep where you're getting to 1% beneficial ownership of the company. And to have a tool for a B of A or a Chase um, to proactively say, hey, these individuals are in cannabis or are not in cannabis, that data is not necessarily there, right? It's kind of hidden. So we've we have it, but we don't. It's, it's an interesting... Yeah, I mean, you're in... Uh, not an emerging category. You're in a, what I would call like the Wild West category where it's going from being lawless, criminal, to being audited and professionalized and compliant. So there's going to be a lot of opportunities. I would, I like the fact that you're mixing it up and, and you find some one of the hard issues, but it may turn out that that hard issue is not super monetizable and there's a better one. So I say stay the course, keep doing what you're doing, and then, as I had said to an earlier guest on uh, this office hours, look for a couple of experiments you might be able to run. And people get too precious like about trying things. The entrepreneurs who win run a lot of tests. And I will be completely confounded with founders or even my own team members when I say, hey, let's do this. And they're like, that's going to be a ton of work. I'm like, okay, let's put up a landing page. Let's send an email and let's see how many people sign up for it. And they're like, but we don't even have a space rented. We don't know. You know, what about this? What about that? What if it fails? And I'm like, yeah, we, we can just have people sign up their interest, right, in something. Uh, so you are well within your rights to make a one-page document about a product that's coming 
and send it to 10 people and say, would you like to talk about this product and just A-B test that product versus another one and creating a landing page for each one and seeing how many people click and how many people engage in it. And it, have you read the Lean Startup or Steve yes. Blank stuff? So mm -hmm. you understand this inherently. Run those tests and see. And the other thing you can do is just take people to lunch who are in the industry, explain to them what you do and just say, you know, I'm, I'm looking to build this business. What are the three or four biggest pain points you have as a business? And they might say, you know, it's, it's actually storing all this cash. Like, I need a better place to put this. You know, and maybe you have a solution for that. Maybe there's some new fangled bank that instead of having electronic records, it goes back to the old days where there's actually like a crazy vault where all the money is and lock boxes. I heard that in one city, they were having such problems that people were driving vans like into specially made garages where they could drive the van and close all the doors, empty the van and then drive an empty van out because they were concerned about walking up the steps with duffel bags of cash. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge problem with the cash. I mean, they're going, even when they're paying their taxes, I mean, they're, they're coming to, you know, the city county offices with $120,000, $250,000 in cash that they're then counting. Yeah, the and the county has never experienced this before. Right. It's literally been 30 or 40 years before anybody showed up. I was like, I need to pay my taxes. Here, here's a brick. Like, it never happens. <laughs> It's so bizarre. They they don't have money counting machines in some cases, right? Like they're no, just I mean they're charging them on top of that. I mean, one of our fees that we do, we have one particular client that is doing hundred and fifty thousand dollars in taxes each month. Well, they have to pay an additional twenty five grand on top of that for them to count their money. Wow, what a scam. <laughs> what a scam. Can't they bring like a hundred dollar bill counter and just be like, here, here's a gift. Here's some here's some money counting machines. Well, that's why the vaults are popping up. There's vaults um, all over right now that are doing that. They use the electronic vault or we'll take it to the Federal Reserve. And then, you know, we're digitizing the money from that aspect. But it's, it's just a process because even though we're able to go through those lengths, we need more banks. And, and so with this long, lengthy process of going through the bank sales cycle, there's only, you know, there's six banks that we're working with here in California and we have some other banks spread out throughout the US but I mean we probably need at least 50 banks to really yeah. bank the industry uh, incredible start uh, keep us up to date on your progress well done okay big Thank round you. of applause